in this stage of our video discussion, we've had a number of videos out there, uh, one thing we've never really talked about, which is probably the, the basis of the understanding of how we perceive in communication with people. And that would be dealing with the concept of the name. Now, if you're looking at from a biblical standpoint, and I always would be going here first on everything, and I know that if you're watching this video, and you may have come across this video for reasons being that something caught your eye, that you saw, that led you to this, and you may not have been from a understanding or a faith that this book is to be viewed as completely infallible. I, uh, all I can do is say, take the time to research it. I'm not here to judge you to say that you've done something wrong because you're at a, a feeling right now at the moment that this has to be challenged. Sometimes we need to challenge it in order to find the, the truth to it. And when you go through researching something and you do your due diligence, then you're at an ability to speak about something. But you'll find that most of the due diligence uh, that people claim they've done, they haven't done. So therefore, most people who mock this book mock it only for one main reason, because it makes them morally responsible to answer back to a maker. And therefore, their creator, and therefore, they feel that they're not as important as they thought they were. And that's generally what we're dealing with, and that's the overall concern of society. So I go to this mainly as my, I go to this com primarily as my foundation of thought. Then we go to other books to understand things. So when we're going to the understanding of the idea of the concept of the word name, as we use in the English language, well, what is a name? Well, if you look to the Bible, you'll find that the people that were in the Bible, especially in the first half of the Bible, and even into the New Testament, were generally only known by their given name, which later became known after the time of Christ and his execution as the Christian name. So they did not have two names. And if someone did have a second name, what did it really have the energy of? Well, you could find that people that generally had a, a second name many times in the Bible, when I'm saying they used both names together in sequence, so it would be like Joseph uh, of Arimathea, that reflected a place. He was like almost like a secret disciple of Jesus Christ. He came a little bit too late. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was not only... Uh, versed or skilled in the in the Jewish law and a member of that organization so to speak the Sanhedrin also responsible unfortunately under his grouping for having been part of the execution of Jesus Christ but came after the fact begged the body of Christ then you have Judas Iscariot well you know that he certainly did not have a good connotation in the in the Bible but you'll find mostly you'll find the spiritual characters in the Bible were people generally holding only one name. So therefore, it is not necessary for somebody to have a surname or a name added to a name. And we're going to get down that subject. We're going to just take you very simply down a journey of looking into a dictionary, anything you could do yourself. And I hope that we understand in these videos, we're not here talking down to you. If someone's got an agenda especially a monetary one, they will try to feel themselves to be superior when they're talking to you. We'll try the best to be at the same level. We're both on the same grounding, keeping our feet on the ground, not up on a platform talking down to you like on a pulpit. And you said something that I just want to mention because it's important. You talked about how a surname is not necessary, and it reminded me of how we were reading the Vital Statistics Act a few days ago. And essentially the Vital Statistics Act in the section we're reading is also saying that the surname is not necessary. Yeah, there was, there, you need to go through a research because we could spend a whole subject, which we will. We'll actually sit down and take, just as a reference, the Ontario, Province of Ontario Vital Statistics Act. We'll go down that and see things that we observe in it so we can just discuss it. So you can make the same uh, conclusions based on obvious facts that are there. Not based on going down an interpretation. We're not here for private interpretation because we're not here soliciting any money. Privacy generally leads to secrecy, 
which leads to an idea that I don't want you to know something. And especially if it's for the wrong reasons, which is generally what goes on with most secrecy and privacy in society, it's generally for a reason uh, of wealth, gain, prosperity, using somebody. And we're not down that path on this. We're here just trying to obtain facts so that we can work together to come to an understanding that can work for charitable good, not work for any negative private gain. God does not need us to have a negative private gain. But God certainly feels extremely good when his servants or people who come to a knowledge of good start to walk it and start to give charitably. If you give free, you will receive free. So do something for others and you will find it will come back to you in many ways for the right reasons, but not in a monetary. Not in the idea that I did this or I'm doing this video because I'm going to have a copyright infringement on it. To me, it would be the best that it just gets distributed completely. And when you say, sorry for interrupting, but when you say, when you do good for the others, the ultimate expression of that for me is John 3 and 16. That's right. Which is, uh, in John 3 and 16, we're dealing with God, who needs not anybody, had so much empathy for sinful mankind that he gave the most ultimate gift to him which was his only begotten son. That was from his own, the first creation, the first most important creation that was there at the beginning of man's creation. And therefore we need to, we need to really um, look at ourselves in order to uh, remove the barriers of ego in order to go down a journey of love and charity because that's giving with no intent to receive. If you receive, it's an unsolicited receiving because someone else wants to do good and therefore provide for you as a gift. Again, with pure gratuitous direction, not for the reason that they're going to receive a monetary reward for it. And therefore, this is where we're going with this information. Then when we're teaching you a word, we're not here because we're gaining something. I'm certainly, even though I may use a Webster's Dictionary, I may use a Law Dictionary, I'm not getting any at all royalty back on that. I have no interest in that. This is just that these were gifted to me, and therefore I have the ability now to use these tools to actually help other people. And this is where we're going with this so you, that people will understand the meanings of the words, because this could open up a whole journey for people uh, in the direction of pure charity. Okay, so what we're going to deal with is, is the name, because the name is the journey. We went a little bit off track, but it wasn't for the wrong reason. And we're going to bring you back to that name. What is in a name? Well, in our society, the operates legally. The word legal. Do your own research on the word legal. But a legal entity or a legal person in our society requires a mask to personify something, to be something. He's known as something. And it requires two components to be a legal person. When you step into the world of legal person, you now have a given name attached to a surname with no separation, joined with just the term name. That's kind of ambiguous, isn't it? That's an, what we call an ambiguity, which means it's not clearly defined because we assume things that the, when it says name that that's what it is. We put comma sometimes in between when we have that word name and then so you'll find like a driver's license will just say name. Though the application requires you to put the surname given name on it, but when the document comes out it's ambiguous. It just has name. And then it, and it, and it may be uh, in various derivative form that came off of what would be the closest thing attached to that which would be the birth certificate. The little wallet size will usually be what we've used the most in order to obtain those other documents. You said the word assume, and in law the word assume means to deceive, does it not? Well, it means deceit because, because someone can assume something does not mean that it truly maybe is. It means he takes it upon himself by a claim that he will have to prove. And if he can't prove his claim, he could have a very arduous journey down that path, assuming. 
So we're going to take down the idea of what a legal person is and now go to the next level. The next level, okay, well let's look at the components that were in that name. Because the best thing to do is break it down. Because you want to find out how did that name come about. Okay, so we understand that in order to be legally participating in something, because you're not going to fill out a document in society without a given name and a surname. We know we have middle names and things, but that's all part of it. And in law, generally, the, the, the given name only requires even a, only one initial. Or uh, it does not require a middle name, though it has been through custom that many people have been given two given names or two Christian names and then a surname. So we want to understand the components now. Now we're going to break it down. So we're going to go to the given name. And in law, it goes back to custom. And understanding in history that the given name was understood at least from the era of AD forward was a Christian name it's been referred to as the Christian name so most law books when you're talking about given name it's usually referring or giving you the reference that it is synonymous with the Christian name so let's look at Christian name Christian name in uh, Webster's Dictionary, we're just going to use this New World Dictionary, third, uh, third college edition. It says, the baptismal name or given name, as distinguished from the surname or family name. So it's, it's separated, it's not the same. Distinguished means not the same. It's distinguished from. Something's distinguished, it gives it a separate meaning. Not part of the same. So it doesn't mean the two are one. Though we may join them together, it does not mean that they are one. And because we do that, could have a completely new thought come about because of the joining of the two. But we're just going to stay with the fact that we're, st we're going to look at the word Christian name, given name, and go to find different references of it to find out what the meaning is. So let's go to Christian name in Samuel Johnson's Dictionary, 1755. This is just excerpts. Uh, this is edited by Jack Lynch. So these are just various words that came out of the first edition. And I will keep on emphasizing this is only out of the first edition. I have always found modifications, editings, after you went past the first edition. So I myself would not be... Uh, in any way suggesting to go use other references of Samuel Johnson beyond the first. And this is the only one I found that has quite a bit of understanding in it of various words from the first edition, which is certainly a lot cheaper than finding the first edition or in its original print, which would be probably about $30,000, 20 to 30 we found on the open market because it's a rare book. Yeah, that book is about $8. Yeah, this book here, we found it... it I guess the well-known bookstores, we're not going to get into that, will actually have this. And a lot of times these have been on the throw-up piles. In other words, they weren't even very interested in actually keeping it in the store. They tossed it out. Maybe there could be some reasons for that. But uh, What's the is, word we're going to define? We're going to define Christian name again. It's better to re-emphasize because when you go to different dictionaries, you may learn different things. More things come to light. Here is Christian name. The name given at the font, baptism, distinct from the gentilitious name or surname. So that's a little bit more clear that it's saying it's a separate name. They're not the same. Now, if it's saying that the surname is the gentilitious name, we mean that's Gentile. Okay, where the term gentleman even came from. Okay, now we're going to go to Noah Webster's Dictionary seven, uh, out of uh, 18... Uh, 1828, and it speaks of it as, let me see if I can get it here, sorry I didn't have it open to that spot, we moved it, oh actually we're going to the word surname because the reference under Christian name was very similar to what we've already read, but the surname, which is the second component of the name, actually gave us some information about the Christian name by going to the word surname, and it says, an appellation added to the original name added to the original name so it's speaking of that the Christian name was the original name so a surname is a name added to the name now Noah Webster's 
dictionary that we read earlier said that Christian name was what we had already discussed. But when we go to surname, it speaks of it along the similar lines. It says, the family name or last name is distinguished from the given name, a name or epithet. So let's go to the word epithet. And the word epithet does not have a very good meaning. So it means that the surname added to the given name or Christian name has a different meaning. And it says epithet. An adjective, noun, or phrase, a disparaging one, used to characterize some person or thing. A descriptive name or title. And we know the scripture already said man should be concerned about accepting or being given any flattering titles out of the Old Testament. Now they mentioned Gentilidius name, which is the surname. Well, let's look at what Gentilidius means out of the Samuel Johnson's Dictionary 1755. And Gentilidius, and we're going to end this excerpt on this note. It's a very broad subject, but uh, the word Gentile means one of an uncovenanted nation, one who knows not the true God. So to be clear, when you have a surname, you're attached to a Gentilius name that doesn't have a covenant with God. Right. And when you put the two together, that could be a very much an understanding of do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers. Oh, so there's something attached or joined or entailed to a Christian name that's not so good, and that's the surname. And therefore, when we operate in society, and we use that in order to operate in the world of commerce, which is for profit, not for charity. Even though the idea is that we run charities for people within the world of commerce, but understand that, that even that word charity is not defined in the Income Tax Act for Canada because we never do pure charity, which means I purely give something as a gift for no apparent gain or reward. Well, when charities issue tax receipts, that's based on a contractual relationship, which means there is consideration there, which means it's void of pure charity. Therefore, that is, in essence, a fraud. So that all reminds me of something we talked about in a different video about the story of the man named Job, which sounds like the word Job, and what's going on here with the words in the name. One of the names, being the Christian name, has to do with working for love and pure charity and peace and grace, whereas the other part of the name, the surname, has negative connotations of working for money not charity, which is legal, and there's no grace and there's no forgiveness when you're working for money, not love. And because Christians are distinguished as a separate, peculiar people, according to Scripture, they're special. They're different from. Therefore, the opportunity is still there for us on this journey to be purely gratuitous, to not be for hire. In fact, the word for hire, which has a lot to do with the reason of a surname, because a surname had a origin of also meaning an occupation, which in we know in today's wording many times means war, which leads back to the original account of man's existence, that when God made man on the sixth day, after that he rested. So God's in his rest day. Man's at occupation in opposition to that. So one part of your name is at rest, the other one's at war, which is a contradiction put together. It doesn't make any sense when you put the two together. And so we run a world of control and chaos. One is chaotic, war. One is control. God, Satan, good, evil, Christian, Gentile, put together, involved in trade together, almost like an evil money changing in the temple, which eventually gets up into this temple, 
And yes, you may convince yourself that you could have the two together and God wants you to be involved in commerce. But God has no gain in you being involved in commerce. He does not need us. We've done nothing to improve anything on this planet other than make it a mess. So please do not tell me we need commerce. Because commerce has polluted your oceans, your waters of fresh water, has polluted your air, has polluted your soil, has polluted your mind. And until you throw that money out of your temple, that evil spirit, that medium of exchange, you will not understand this. Because charity, in its pure sense, has nothing to do with money. The love of money is the root of all evil. So when you take your Christian name and add it to a surname, you've got love and you've got money. Because the money only occurs through the occupation or the surname. There is no money in the Christian name. There is peace in there. There is love. But there is not money. Join the two together. You've got love and money. And I hope we understand that as the end of this part of the video. I just want to add one final thing. You referred to a medium in exchange. But what Christians really need to do is to exchange the legal right in the secular world to sin for God's grace, pardon, and peace. And we already have that it's a gift. You cannot earn salvation. The old half of the Bible, the Old Testament, was the proof that man could never earn his salvation. And it showed it. And the original nation of Israel failed. Failed miserably, proving they could not even follow the law. They failed as a nation, and God condemned them as a nation. And especially those that did not accept the Messiah, His Son, and therefore they did not accept the remedy which broke down the barrier wall of which the promise to Abraham proved would come, which was a blessing to all the nations through the seed of Abraham based on his faith. So therefore they denied their heritage and when they refused to accept that, God's Spirit left them. Just as God's Spirit left Adam when he sinned. He no longer had God's energy which made him immortal. He had cut that off and no longer had a spirit and therefore it became a carnal, temporal, fleshly, diseased entity. And that's what we operate in when we put the gift of Christ beside the unbelieving side of that surname, which led to those that were unbelievers, which were what the Christians eventually were preaching to, which were those that were denying the remedy, denying God's gift, denying the fact that they can only receive grace through accepting the source of life that came from God, which came through Jesus Christ. So we need to educate ourselves through scripture, through words, but we hope that this part of the video at least brings you to a better understanding of why we operate today in society with those two names together. Because legal, a legal person requires both names together in contradistinction distinction to each other, whereas grace is the complete opposite of that, which is something you can't earn. You can't pass that down to your child or to your loved ones by a will. You can only give it to them and help them by speaking to them about this, but it's something they must accept themselves. It's a gift only based on acceptance, not based on a hereditary, secular will that passes down through the hereditary arms name that we use in society. So one is a short term, and the other one is a long term. And the choice will be what we choose. But there is an alphabet going on, the first bet, that said, as Satan challenged on the story of Job, the account of Job said that Job would only serve God for money, for monetary reward. We know he proved otherwise, and he never cursed God, therefore he wasn't involved in cursive writing, as we are today. But he overcame the presumption that he would only serve God for monetary reward. And as we today, because we already have the gift of the peace of Christ in our Christian name, 
it is awaiting us an inheritance by adoption. Because the promise was there for everyone. Whether they were of the original Jewish nation or not, the promise to Abraham was to bless all the nations. So we were all one family under Christianity. And that's why you have a Christian name that is separate and distinguished from that surname. But when you put the two together, you are not in the pure faith that was promised. Therefore, you are not of the seed of Abraham when both of those names are together. So we're down this journey of these videos, I hope, by true charity, pure charity, will help you to understand this. And we hope that we'll all come to an acknowledgement so that we're put in the book of life and not remain in a book of death.